Good evening. For those of you I've not yet had the chance to meet, my name is John Heibusch and I am the Executive Director of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening. Before we get started, if you have a cell phone or a pager, we'd really appreciate it if you would turn it off. That would be great. Now, in honor of our men and women in uniform who defend our freedom around the world, if you'd please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> Before we get started, I'd like to recognize some special guests we have with us in the audience tonight. Uh, first, we have with us our own Ventura County Supervisor, Peter Foy. Peter. We also have with us our city council members from the city of Simi Valley, Thousand Oaks, and Moore Park. If you all would stand, please. I'd like to also welcome this evening Mr. Duke Blackwood, the director of the Reagan Library. Duke. Okay, I have to admit, especially if you've had a chance to read Carl's book, Courage and Consequence, that it is a bit difficult in an introduction like this to tell a politically astute audience something about Carl Rove that you don't already know. For example, with certainty, you all know that Carl was the driving force behind the successful campaigns for governor of then-candidate Bush back in 1994 and his re-elect for governor in 1998. <laughs> this, one's a, this next one's a bigger round of applause, as well as the architect of President Bush's victories in both 2000 and 2004. <laughs> Then you would also know that Carl went on to serve as senior advisor, and senior advisor and deputy chief of staff to President Bush at the White House. Next to President Bush and Vice President Cheney, it would be difficult to find another figure in the Bush White House or anywhere else in government at that time with greater influence than Carl. And everyone here undoubtedly also knows that Carl is now an author a columnist for Newsweek and the Wall Street Journal, as well as a contributor to Fox News. So, <laughs> so in the interest of telling you something new about Carl, I would like to start with a question. I'd like to know how many people here use the internet and at one time or another have used a search engine like Google? Is there anyone here that has? <laughs> Okay, so virtually everyone. Well, then most of you will be familiar with predictive search. It's the ability of your search engine to think ahead of you as you're typing to help you find the term or the person or the phrase that you're looking for. It's all based on the search habits of hundreds of millions, even billions of people who have, like you, searched for the same or a similar word or phrase before. For example, if you type in Ronald, before you know it, you see an entire drop-down menu of choices before you to finish the phrase, the very first of which is Reagan. For those interested, the second most popular choice when you type in Ronald is McDonald, but that is, <laughs> that is for another story. Typing in George gets you Washington, and of course typing in Barack gets you <laughs> that would be Obama, uh, and so forth. So yes, you might have guessed it by now, in the year 2010, when you type in Carl, you get? Actually, no, you get marks. <laughs> but indeed, in second place, and this is extremely telling, is our guest speaker tonight, Mr. Carl Rove. 
Now, believe me, I am not trying to draw a valid comparison between Rove and Marx. Um, one can probably not find two people at greater polar opposites. But when it comes to making history, it is certainly remarkable, is it not, that in just a few decades of politics and service to his country, Karl Rove has taken his place not just as top of mind for the world search engines, but also for all of us as one of the world's most influential and effective political strategists of this or any other decade. Of all the observations made about Karl Rove in public life, your search engine will tell you there are now 2.5 million. What I would like to do in introducing Karl is focus on a trait of the man that all too often seems to become somewhat of an endangered species in modern day politics, and it is a trait called loyalty. No doubt, Carl is extremely smart. Even his adversaries begrudgingly describe him as a political genius. No doubt, he is talented. He has engineered the election of candidates for the House and the Senate in over two dozen states, as well as the President of the United States twice. But above all else, what Carl possesses, and you will find this in his book, is a rare commodity in the modern day world of bare knuckle politics. It is an absolute and fierce sense of loyalty to those he has served. I am sure there are few in this room, if any, that cannot remember back to the extraordinary withering fire that President Bush faced day in, day out, as he accepted the consequences of his courage and ideals. What you will also remember, and we should never forget, is that during that entire time, it was Karl Rove who shared or absorbed most of the blows of criticism without hesitation and without complaint so that others would not. He practices that loyalty to this day, from how he chose to write his book, to the support of his colleagues and friends, his causes, his country, and to the president he served. We are grateful for it, and we are honored to have him here. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Carl Rove. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. You keep that up and I'll get O'Reilly in here. <laughs> oh no, not that guy. <laughs> well, first of all, thanks for that very generous introduction. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm honored to be back at the Reagan Library and that was a very thoughtful and kind introduction. Um, Karl Marx. <laughs> Actually, there's a connection. You uh, remember the first civics class you took? fourth or fifth grade, and the first time you had to write a paper for it, you probably wrote it on the three branches of government or our capital, our constitution. I didn't. I was the complete nerd. About the third grade, I had thick glasses, hush puppies when they weren't cool, a pocket protector, and a briefcase. So by the fourth or fifth grade, when I wrote my first civics paper, it was on the theory of dialectical materialism. <laughs> it's just, it's not just that Marx and I share a first name, it's that at a very early age, I knew I didn't like him. <laughs> um, loyalty to people, well, I'm, I am a loyal guy, I like to be a loyal guy, but not just because I'm loyal to people, I'm loyal to the causes and the ideals for which they stand. And so it was easy in this book and I hope you enjoy it if you read it, to stand up and say, here's what we did and here's why we did it. And to do so in a frank and candid and honest way. I drew back the curtain. I didn't pull the punches. I, I acknowledged mistakes, particularly mistakes that I made. But I wanted people to know the facts because while history is still being shaped and the time is still fresh in people's minds, I wanted to take the vantage point that I had for nearly seven years, which was just down from the Oval Office, and talk about it. You know, the average tenure of a White House aide is about 18 months, and I was there nearly seven years. And when I showed up, I had hair and it wasn't gray. <laughs> uh, 
I want to talk tonight uh, for a brief period of time and then take your questions. But I want to talk about the man who's in, in whose name uh, we gather uh, and less about my book, though you'll get a little bit of the hint of the book. But I'd be happy to answer or talk about the book in, in the Q&A afterwards. But it really is, we, you know, it's, we're drawn together here by our love for a great monumental figure in our history. And he was also a monumental figure, I suspect, in a lot of your individual lives. You, you came of age politically at a time when he was big on the stage or you were drawn into his campaigns here in California or you were inspired by his leadership. I remember when I met him. Actually, I, when I first saw him, I remember also when I met him. I, I saw him for the first time when I was 17 years old. And he came into Salt Lake City where I was in high school in a very powerful year in our nation's history, 1968. And that was the year that, my, that a liberal high school government teacher made certain that, that, uh, that those of us who were his charges saw Richard Nixon, Hubert Humphrey, and George Wallace visit Utah to campaign for the vote in the primary and the general election. And I also saw Ronald Reagan when he came in June of 68 to the state convention, and I've never seen a room as raunchous and loud as that one was when that tall, athletic, good-looking movie actor came in and wowed that crowd with a speech of substance and principle and conviction. It was really an extraordinary moment. But I first met him not too many years later when I was working for the Republican Party of Virginia, and he was getting ready to run for president in 1976. And I remember something that I only, you know, I, I, I met him, and I was a young guy, 25 years old, and the finance director of the Republican Party of Virginia. And I remembered meeting him, and in the back room, before things sort of began, I remember how tired he looked. But then he walked out in front of a crowd of 1,200, 1,500 people. I mean, you know, the magic came on. And I thought about that in the years since, and it seemed to me that was not the man I saw in the Oval Office. And I wonder if it was harder for Reagan to audition for the task of being commander in chief and chief executive of the United States than to actually do it. I saw a confidence there and a fluidity and an ease when he was, had the job that I didn't see when he was sort of auditioning for it as a candidate in 1976. And I think that says something about the natural ability of Ronald Reagan. He was a transformational leader in so many ways. He had enormous unrecognized skills as a leader. You know, he changed the direction of our country. How many people, you know, look, there are people who come along and hold that job, and they sort of bend the arc of the country a little bit this way or that way. But think how fundamentally different our country was when it came to taxes and spending and national security and the role of the government and the confidence of our nation, the values of our country, the role of America in the world. All of these things were fundamentally different after than before. And it was because of the, the, the passion and the conviction and the subtle leadership of one man. So much changed. We had, we even had a different Republican Party, not inward looking and angry and, 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 and afraid. It was an optimistic and sunny and forward looking Republican Party. The Democratic Party was changed by Ronald Reagan. Bill Clinton would have been impossible before Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan convinced Democrats that the only way you could win was to say the era of big government was over and run hard to the middle, not hard to the left. And even then he barely got in, 43% of the vote. But he changed the Democratic Party. And for 28 years, his legacy from 1980 to 2008 has stood astride the nation like a colossus at Rhodes. It's been a remarkable achievement of one man. And you look back in history, and there are not a lot of people who do that. Now, starting in 2008, his legacy since then has been under attack from the new administration. At first glance, they share something in common, that they're transformational leaders. But if you think about it for a minute, there's a big and deep difference between the two. With Reagan, you knew what you were getting. He ran for something and then did it once he got it. There was no guile. He was clear. He held his cards out there and showed them to the American people and said, elect me and here's what I'm going to do. It's not what we got from, from the current administration. He ran, candidate Obama was a relentless centrist. He was first of all somebody who said, you know, I'm going to be a fiscal conservative. Quote, I will scrub the budget line by line and end government programs that do not work, end quote. 
He was a deficit hawk. He decried the deficits that under Bush that had ran 2% of GDP. The post-World War II average is 1.6%. And he decried those deficits as too big. He was a tax cutter. He said, I'm going to cut and reduce taxes for those who make less than $250,000 a year. Look, I'm sort of obsessive about these things. So I had one of my aides, not me, believe me, I wasn't going to do this myself, but I had one of my aides read every one of his speeches <laughs> that he gave between June and November. And actually, the poor woman is here tonight with me, Kristen Davidson. She's back here someplace. <laughs> Kristen, wherever you are, that's in lieu of a pay raise. Every speech he gave between June and November, and count up how many words he devoted to the issue of taxes. And for every four words that he talked about cutting taxes, he devoted one word to raising taxes, and most of the time only to say, I'm going to, quote, return tax rates to the way that they were under President Clinton. Not exactly a stirring call to tax the rich. Soak the rich. In fact, in the most widely watched speech of the entire campaign, his Denver convention speech, President Obama didn't mention the word raising taxes once. You know, he ran as a person who said, you didn't see this in California because you were in a battleground state, but if you were in a battleground state, the most secondly widely displayed Obama campaign ad said, quote, government-run health care extreme, end quote. Now, Reagan came into office and after having said, I'm going to cut your taxes, rebuild America's defense, get the government out of your lives, limit the power of the federal government, respect the states, and make America strong and respected around the world again. And when he did it, confidence in government rose. Today, after we have been subjected to a campaign that said, I'm going to be a centrist, and 14 months of being something else, confidence in the federal government is near an all-time low. You have to go back to the months around and after Richard Nixon's resignation to find levels like this. He has not governed as he campaigned on spending. When he came into office, he passed the $787 billion stimulus bill, a $30 billion S-chip expansion. You may not know this, but in the middle of the fiscal year, in February of last year, he increased discretionary non-security -dom non domestic spending by 8% in the middle of the year, and then proposed a budget that on top of that new higher level, we went from $393 billion discretionary domestic spending, it had been 391 the previous year, to 410 in the middle of the year, and then, he increased that by 12% for the coming year, for the year in which we now find ourselves. So between January and November, we increased discretionary domestic spending by 25% in one year. That means we will, even if we hold it flat for, for at inflation only, we'll spend $1.2 trillion more money over the next 10 years than we, would, than we were anticipated spending on January 19, 2009, the day before he was inaugurated. The deficits, which were so bad under Bush, at least with Bush, as with Reagan, the economy was growing. When Bush came into office, the size of the national uh, economy was $9.7 trillion, and when he left office, it was 14.2. That $4.5 trillion in economic growth is bigger than the entire Japanese economy. This president will run up more debt in the first 20 months and 11 days of his term in office than Bush did in eight years. The only difference is the economy will be slightly smaller at the end of the first 20 months and 11 days than it was when he came into office. And taxes? Well, first thing he did was come into office and sign a bill increasing taxes on cigarettes. Now look, I'm not a guy who holds for smoking. My dad died of it. But you can't tell me that the only people who smoke in America make them more than $250,000 a year. <laughs> then, then, we, then he tried to pass a cap and trade bill which would levy an energy tax of between $100 to $200 billion a year on who? Anybody who flips a light switch, drives a car, or buys anything manufactured or shipped inside the United States. Last time I looked, that was all of us, <laughs> including a few people who make less than $250,000 a year. <laughs> And then on health care, we've seen what, we, what he's tried to give us and what he gave us, which is a massive expansion of government that I want to return to in just a minute. And then finally, the role of America in the world. You know, look, if Ronald Reagan was concerned with being loved rather than respected, do you think he would have put the Persian missiles into Europe, an act which hastened the decline and the demise of, of Soviet communism? No. It is better that the United States of America be respected by our friends 
and our adversaries and feared by our adversaries than it is that we be popular. And could you imagine Ronald Reagan taking a grand ally like Israel and humiliating its prime minister publicly as they did by first publicizing the phone call between the Secretary of State and the prime minister and then bringing him to Washington and doing what he did this week, which was hold him at the White House, berate him, then leak it to the press that we don't trust Israel, nor do we trust Netanyahu, and then refusing even to release a photograph of the two of them meeting. This is our staunch, staunch and stalwart ally in the Middle East, a democracy in the heart of a very difficult part of the world, and we should be encouraging Israel and, get, and offering her the hand of friendship publicly, <laughs> not berating her. But there are two big differences on two big fundamental questions that I want to talk about briefly. There are different views of where wealth comes from. What does government do to grow the economy? Ronald Reagan said, cut the taxes, reduce the regulation, make for hard money for solid, stable dollar, and let the entrepreneurship and the wisdom and the energy and the dreams and the idealism of Americans flourish in creating jobs and prosperity. And he did it. Remember how bad things were when he came into office? Remember, you know, how, how awkward it was seen? I mean, it was America's greatest moments behind it. And instead, a sunny and optimistic actor came in and said, it's really very simple. I trust the people. They are the people who create the wealth and the jobs and the prosperity. Think about the difference between the Reagan tax cuts of 81, which the Democrats knew how powerful they were. They couldn't stop them, but they knew the twin engines of Graham Rudman's spending restraint and the Reagan tax cuts. They feared what it would do to our economy. They knew it would get it growing. That's why they delayed the 81 tax cuts so that, they, so that their full effect would be held, held after the 82 election. They didn't, they didn't want the economy going and blowing by the time of the 82 election. They wanted it later. They wanted more Democrats elected. They understood what it meant. Take a look at the stimulus bill. $787 billion, very little of it in tax cuts, very little of it aimed at generating jobs, and as a result, it hasn't. We were promised there'd be 4 million new jobs. We'd get them because there were shovel-ready projects. 90% of them would be in the private sector, and it all would happen because the money went out quickly. Go to recovery.org. Thank God for Al Gore and the Internet. <laughs> I don't know how he came up with it, but it's a marvelous invention. <laughs> Go check recovery.org. They've only spent about a third of the money. They'll spend more money between 2011 and 2019 than they will spend last year when they were trying to stimulate the economy. Imagine, some guy has a heart attack. The EMS shows up, they pull out the paddles, they say, clear, this will take a week or two. <laughs> you know, <laughs> guy be dead. Then the idea of, you know, 4 million jobs, since they signed the bill, we've lost 2.8 million. They said, oh, well, we're going to, then they started saying we're going to save them as well as create them. And then they dropped this saving thing because every economist said there's no way to, you know, to forecast to exactly how many jobs anything really saves. Go to recovery.org. It says funded. They've gotten down to that. They said at the end of last year, by the end of last year, they had funded 595,623 jobs. And read them. They're not in the private sector. Most of them are government jobs, and they include jobs for which they gave a pay raise. In fact, you know what's really revealing? January 10th of 2009, the designated chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, 10 days before President Obama was sworn into office, issued a report laying out the philosophical underpinning of the stimulus bill. And it said for every dollar of spending by government, there would be $1.50 in economic growth. Hey, if that's the case, why'd we stop at $787 billion? <laughs> Spend $2 trillion and get a trillion external growth, $3 trillion and pocket the trillion. Do $5 trillion and get $7.5 trillion, pocket $2.5 trillion. Do $10 and get $15. I mean, come on. <laughs> There's the fundamental difference. Ronald Reagan understood that wealth came from the hard work and the intelligence and the creativity of free minds and free people and free markets. This crowd... <laughs> this crowd, they think 
that government creates, uh, creates prosperity by spending. No country in the history of the world has spent its way to prosperity, and that's exactly what they're trying to do with this job, with this stimulus bill. Then we have health care. <laughs> you know, I spoke here in 2005, July 11th. I'll never forget it. Mrs. Reagan was here. I was so deeply honored to be here. It was one year and six days after he had passed, and she was here. And in preparing my speech that night, I went back and read a lot of what Ronald Reagan had said and written. This was just after the Andersons had, had discovered the, had the transcripts of the radio programs, and I read the letters. And I went back and looked at his books. In 1976, he said, Our system freed the individual genius of man, released him to fly as high and as far as his own talent and energy would take him. Capitalism may not be a perfect system, but it's better than any other that's ever been tried. Then, five years after that, as president, he said, if we look to the answer as to why for so many years we have achieved so much, prospered as no other people on earth, it was because here in this land we unleashed the, in, the energy and individual genius of man to a greater extent than has ever been done before. I don't think that Ronald Reagan, I don't mean to speak for him, but I don't see his principles enunciated in this health care reform. <laughs> the core of it is an expansion of dependency on government. 31 million additional people will get covered, 16 million of them by being thrown into Medicaid, welfare health care, second class health care, and the other 15 million, including people who make up to nearly $70,000 a year, will get it by having their insurance company receive a generous subsidy. $466 billion in subsidies for insurance companies and $434 billion in the federal share of Medicaid matched by a considerable sum from, states and from the states. It is an unaffordable cost. If you look at it, they said, oh, it's only $950 billion for the first 10 years. But no, this thing does not start to expand Medicaid or provide subsidies to, subsidies to the insurance companies for four years. And those subsidies in the Medicaid expansion are not fully operational until year seven. If you look at year seven through year 16, the first 10 years of the program, the cost is $2.6 trillion. Nor is this thing going to be uh, reduce the deficit as they claimed. I loved it when they said, well, this will reduce it by $138 billion. And then I peeked underneath the surface of it. And they only arrive at that number by accounting practices that send Bernie Madoff to jail. <laughs> they count $50 billion plus of Social Security payroll taxes twice. Once as payroll taxes into Social Security and once as money that they will spend on the current medical benefit. You can't do that. You can't spend the same dollar twice. They count $70 billion plus in premium income payment for a new government entitlement for long-term health care twice. Once as premium payments for this benefit that's going to have to be paid out at $50 a day in coverage for the people who have the long-term care benefit. And they counted as $70 billion they spend on the current new, new health care program. They take $456 billion in Medicare cuts. Medicare, after all, is $38 trillion in deficit over the next 75 years. And they say, isn't it marvelous? We cut it 456, we save $456 billion in the next 10 years. Think how much money that's going to save us when you cast that over after the next 75 years. It's going to be literally, we're going to make it nearly solvent. And then they turn around and spend the same $456 billion on the current new benefit that they're laying out, the subsidies to the insurance companies and the welfare expansion through Medicaid. You cannot spend the same dollar once. I try and convince my 21-year-old college kid, my son, you can only spend that money that you get each month once. Budget yourself. <laughs> and this thing, this thing, under the cover of United States law, we have the President of the United States saying solemnly, 
Trust me, it's going to cut the deficit, not raise it. The deficit will not drop by $138 billion in the first 10 years. It will rise $618 billion if their estimates of what the cost of the program are accurate. And I would remind you there's only been one instance where, the government, where a government-run health program costs less than anticipated. Every other one besides the Medicare prescription Part D program that was, that was, that was designed by Republicans and used market forces to design it, every other program is way over budget. And this is a government-run program, and that's the final point to make about it. It doesn't put the individual in charge. It doesn't rely upon the creativity of the patient and the doctor. It doesn't require market forces in order to operate. It is a bureaucrat in Washington deciding prices, deciding benefits, writing the programs, and Ronald Reagan trusted ordinary people to make better decisions in their lives than to rely upon Washington bureaucrats, and we should too. I see, I see in the alternative that has been laid out by creative minds on the conservative side of the aisle, both in think tanks and in Congress, as representing more the Reagan legacy of empowering the individual. When you say, well, you know what, why is it that the companies get the tax benefit? Why don't we give the tax benefit for having health insurance to the individual, not to the company? It would put the individual in charge. They would own their health care policy. They could take it from job to job with them, and they wouldn't feel stuck in a job for fear of losing their benefits. It would empower the individual, neither the company nor the government. That's a Reagan idea. It's a Reagan idea. It's a Reagan idea to say, if you have more people competing for your business, you're going to get better benefits and lower prices. Anybody here got your auto insurance from Geico? <laughs> yeah. A woman, did you raise your hand? Yeah. This woman gets her auto insurance from a lizard in Bethesda, Maryland. <laughs> Why is it that we cannot buy health insurance across state line like we do auto insurance? <laughs> Having a national market. You can't... Yeah. You can't, you can't turn on the television without some auto insurance company saying, come to us, we'll give you a lower price and better benefits. Same thing would happen if we had a national market in health insurance. Free, speaking of free markets, why is it that the big guys get the discounts and the little guys don't? Why don't we let small business people pool their risk so they get the same discounts the big boys get? We shouldn't be, you know, look. I'm, I'm happy that Hewlett Packard gets the lower price. I'm happy that General Electric gets the lower price. But why not let all the landscapers join together, all the people who own fast food joints, or all the left-handed orthodontists who play golf on alternate Thursdays? <laughs> let them join together and pool their risk and get the discounts by, by pooling. Isn't that what insurance is all about? That's a Reagan idea. What about saying that the individual can save tax-free for their out-of-pocket medical expenses? You can save tax-free for retirement. You can save tax-free for your kids' education expenses. If you've got a health savings account, you can save up to $5,000 a year for tax-free for your out-of-pocket medical expenses. Except next year, guess what? The smart people in the Senate and the smart people in the House have decided they don't trust you, so next year they're going to start slashing the amount of money you can save tax-free for your out-of-pocket medical expenses. Now, why is that important? Because being able to save tax-free for your out-of-pocket medical expenses means you can couple it with a low-cost, high-deductible, low-premium, catastrophic coverage that covers you on the bad e back end if something bad happens. And particularly for younger workers, it's very attractive. I got a micro-business. I got six people. One old guy, a bunch of young people. I fund their accounts. They all have HSAs. They get to save tax-free, and I give them the money for it. And then I let them elect based on what they got in their HSA, do you want to have a higher deductible and a lower premium, and you pay the premium? And guess what? They save the money. They're good consumers. They say, hey, doc, do I really need to spend that money? And if so, what do I need that for? And why? I just got my bill from Aetna. Premium for this year. Down 20%. That's a Reagan idea. Put the individual in charge. Make them empower them as a consumer. Nothing more powerful than a consumer walking in saying, what's this going to cost and what's a good... Would you go buy a car without knowing how much it cost or how good it was? No. And yet we expect people in the, in the question of their own health to act that way. Speaking of that, we ought to have transparency and pricing and quality. You go back and read some of those Reagan things. He wants us all to be out there saying, what's in it for me when it comes to buying something? And yet we don't know that today. When you go to a hospital, you don't know what the bill is going to look like 
or what its quality is. We did a study when I was in the government at HHS of hospitals in the Milwaukee area in 2005. I think there were like 13 hospitals. We looked at the 20 most common procedures. There was no relationship between price and quality. You could go to a relatively inexpensive hospital and get better quality. And not only that, but you go to one hospital and the procedure would be 3,800 bucks and one three miles away would charge you 7,800 bucks. One would charge you for 11,000, one would charge you 19,000. We ought to have transparency in price and transparency in quality so we know what we're buying. And finally, we believe in personal responsibility in, a, in an environment in which business can flourish and healthcare is after all a business, it's a profession. So we ought to get rid of these junk lawsuits that are driving up the cost of health care for every American. <laughs> You'll be happy to know I'm coming to the end. <laughs> you know, one other thing. I know this has been a bad week. It has been. Let's admit it. If you're a conservative, this has not been a happy week. But there's a lesson from Reagan. And the lesson is, is that we better be optimistic and sunny and forward-looking and passionate in our beliefs and committed to the cause. He stepped onto the stage at a moment that conservatism was about ready to suffer a grave and some thought fatal disaster. The election of 1964. And there was Reagan soldiering on in the final moments as Goldwater was going down to an historic loss and all the pundits said, oh, the Republicans and the conserv conservatism is dead and we'll never see it rise again. A year ago, Americans favored the concept of health care reform by two to one in the polls. The White House was strongly in favor of it and the president went out and gave 58 speeches, including two nationally televised addresses. The Congress was dominated by Democrats, 60-40, 59-41 in the Senate, 255 to 178 in the House. And they talked about it endlessly. Despite the fact that the number one issue was jobs and the economy, they wanted to make health care, transform it, taking it over, putting it under command of the, of the government, taking one-sixth of the economy and removing it from the private sector and putting it in the hands of the government. That was their goal. And they talked about it endlessly and put it in the most alluring and bright and, and charming terms. And yet at the end of that year, in the two weeks leading up to the vote in Congress, the American people had educated themselves, paid attention to the issue. Some of them have even gone so far as to download the bill off of the internet and run it off on their printer. <laughs> Admit it, there are a couple of you in the room. I can tell from the nervous <laughs> laughter. Raise your hands. More trees were killed in order that you could understand. Yeah, I know you did it. And you know who you are. <laughs> and didn't you get a little thrill up your leg when you read page 212? <laughs> but you know what happened? The American people demonstrated their good common sense in, two weeks, in the two weeks leading up to the vote. If you took all those polls and surveys that said, do you favor the bill supported by President Obama and the Democrats in Congress, it was 38% in favor and 60% opposed. Only 2% of the people didn't have an opinion. And the strongly opposed outnumbered the strongly favored by two to one. So my message is this. We lost the first battle, but we haven't lost the war as long as we don't lose our confidence and our optimism. That's the lesson of Reagan. He did not. He did not lose his sunny optimism after 1964. He didn't go into the fetal position after 1976. He knew the greatness that is our country. And as a result, he won, he acted, he led, he changed our country and made us a greater and grander nation and people as a result. Thanks for having me here tonight. I'd be happy to answer back your question. All right, I'll talk too long, but let's get on the questions quick. Uh, if, you, if you do have a question, if you could please uh, raise yeah, your hand, and then we've got people with microphones in the aisle, and that would be great. All right, there we go. Yes, sir. 
I want to understand how the person who's leading our country isn't an anti-Semite by the way he treats Israel, sets back the peace process by decades, by leaving someone sitting, by not having photo ops. Yeah. How does a person, also, how does a person internally give someone who tries to uh, destroy 200 lives on a plane over Detroit an attorney within an hour? Yeah. How he, uh, according to John Thiessen, with courting disaster, releases all military secrets, so now it's available not only to us, but to the yeah. enemy. Uh, I, I don't understand how that might yeah. work. Look, he's got a different worldview than we do. He does. I, I don't believe that he's anti-Semitic. I just don't. But I do believe that he, ha I, I do believe that he, that he is, that he has a sympathy for the Palestinian cause and an antipathy to Israel that is not in keeping with the, with the bipartisan tradition of all of our presidents, starting with Harry S. Truman. I just don't believe he's right on this question. I do think Mark Thiessen, whom you mentioned, it's Mark, not John, wrote a brilliant book. After you finish reading mine, <laughs> get courting disaster. Look, I've supported President Obama when I think he's right. He was right in doing what he did in keeping our troops in Iraq and not giving in to the left of his party. He did the right thing. He did the right thing in Afghanistan. I didn't think he did, you know, he didn't need to sort of wring his hands for eight situation room meetings and three months of consideration just so he looks like he's thoughtful. But he did the right thing, and it wasn't easy for him to do. He's doing the right thing, and you may not know this, by continuing the policy of President Bush and expanding the defensive technologies that we provide to our allies in the Persia Gulf region and expanding America's military presence there as a tripwire. Having said that, what he has done wrong is things like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Look, that guy, I read some of those reports, not all of them, but some of them. I know some of what we got from him, and you know some of what he got from him. You know the tip of it. What we got from him helped us break up things like a plot to fly an airplane into the tallest building in Los Angeles, the Library Tower. It allowed us to, fo to foil a plot in which they were going to bring down 10 airliners over the Pacific simultaneously. They were weeks away from launching a plot, a program, an action, which would have flown planes into Heathrow and a Canary Wharf to office complex in, in London. And we got information from Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. And the idea that we would put him on trial in New York City and give him access to not only lots of secrets that he could spread around, but also what he wanted more than anything else. Look, this is a guy who knew what was going to happen to him. He knew as the mastermind of 9-11 that he was going to either end his life at the end of a very long, dark period by, by, you know, by being allowed to expire naturally in some dark hole someplace, having never seen the, the, the light of day, or that he was going to be executed. What he desperately wanted and knew he could not have was the moment on the world stage in which he could make himself into a martyr, in which he could proclaim the injustice of America and inflame the Islamic world and recruit thousands of additional jihadists to his cause. And guess what? That's about ready what Barack Obama was ready to do and give it to him on the stage in New York City. Can you Look, we live in a global world. That, that, that what he said and did in that trial would be broadcast around the world and anybody who thinks this is going to play out like some drama on law and order where, there, where the guy says, yeah, you got me, I'm guilty and I'm sorry I did it, is kidding themselves. <laughs> and let me just tell you how lethal this could be. Andrew McCarthy was the prosecutor who put away the blind shake. And during the course of putting away the blind shake, the defense asked for a list of all of the persons of interest that the FBI was investigating in connection with the blind shake case. So they had to hand over to the, def to the defense classified information as to who these people were. After 9-11 and after we brought down the Taliban, guess what we found in Taliban training camps in Afghanistan? The list of the people of interest that was handed over to the defense in the blind shake case. Sources and methods of intelligence would be compromised and America would be much less safe if this were allowed to go forward. Now, I think he is beginning to see the light of reason and we may have a military tribunal in private, in secret, where this man gets the justice that he richly deserves. for being at the library and thank you for coming to Simi Valley. And my question is, it was reported on local news channels that originally you didn't support Mr. Cheney being on the GOP ticket. That's Did right. You to expand? That's right. So it's in the book. <laughs> <laughs> and I put it in the book for a reason. I wanted people, people to get a sense of who George W. Bush was. 
and how he thought. He's a guy, one of the exciting things, and one of the reasons that so many people were able to stay at the White House for so long with such a punishing regime was it was fun to, to work there. Because you, you were prized for what you said. You did your homework, made your case, you won points. Whether you're the president agreed with you or not. Look, he didn't keep me around because of my pretty face. <laughs> he did not keep me around because of my athletic ability. <laughs> he kept me around because he knew I would walk in and say, Mr. President, you're not looking so pretty. <laughs> July of 2000, Bush is thinking about who his vice presidential running mate is going to be. We're looking at nine people. And Bush is sort of focused in on Cheney, the guy who's in charge of the process. But he's become convinced that he ought not to be in charge of the process. He ought to be the result of the process. He ought to be the nominee. And there are about six people who know this. The President, Laura, Joe Albaugh, Cheney, Karen Hughes, and me. And I'm against it. So Bush is coming into town. He calls me from the road. He says, come over to the mansion tomorrow morning. Tell me why not Cheney. So I show up about 10 o'clock. We sit in the Austin Library. It's a little room in the, in, the, in the governor's mansion in Texas named after the land speculator who founded Texas, Stephen F. Austin. Came from Missouri, wanted to make himself rich, was the founder of Texas. The room has the only portrait done from life of Davy Crockett in his western duds. <laughs> there are lots of portraits of Davy Crockett as a Whig congressman in a black frock coat with a white sort of, you know, fancy shirt. But this is the only one of them done in his western duds. He's in his, in his deerskin outfit, carrying his Kentucky long rifle with his favorite, favorite dog. And let me just tell you, he doesn't look like either Fess Parker or John Wayne. He just doesn't. <laughs> he looks like a dandy. The guy's got curls, and he's sort of cute. And you know, it's like, that's, that's not, yeah, well, no wonder they called him Davy rather than David. I mean, you know, <laughs> hey, Davy. All right, so, so we sit down. And Bush says, OK, give it to me. And I say, look, here are my eight reasons why we shouldn't go with Cheney, starting with, we don't need to worry about Wyoming's three electoral college votes. <laughs> Cheney had a very conservative voting record from a very conservative state. For God's sake, he voted against a resolution calling for the release of Nelson Mandela from prison in the 1970s. <laughs> we're we're going to go out and defend that one for a little while. The guy had his first heart attack at age 37 and has been practicing on it ever since. <laughs> you know, and I, the rest, of, you know, and I got eight of them. You know, it's like that. You know, we got a 12th Amendment problem. Can't cast the votes of the, of the, of the same state for candidates for president, vice president who reside in the same state. Now, Cheney's from Wyoming, but he's registered at that point in Texas. In fact, you know, Bush has got a reputation as an oilman. In fact, I'm sitting in, Andy, Andy Malcolm right there, who's standing up there, Andy Malcolm worked in the Bush campaign. Andy would have had to deal with these stuff. And so, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, we have worked hard to overcome the idea that Bush is a Texas oilman, so let's get the guy who's running Halliburton, an oil service company, let's get him as the vice presidential running mate. You know? Anyway, so I got my reasons. This goes on for half an hour. I'm laying out my case, and the governor of Texas saying, I don't agree with that, or what if I said this, or how would you answer that, or blah, blah, and we're going at it. We're going at it pretty good. At the end of about 30 or 35 minutes, I've run through my list. He says, you got anything else? <laughs> I said, no. He said, good. Turns to the guy next to him and says, Dick, got any questions for Carl? I'm thinking, great, I've just irritated the guy who's going to be the next vice president. <laughs> and he goes around heavily armed. <laughs> I put it in the book, though, because I wanted people to see that Bush wanted people around him who would tell him what they believed and make the best case for it. Bush called me the next day. He said, you're right on every one of your points. But that's all politics. You go figure out how to solve the politics. You can do it. He said, I got confidence in you. Go start working on that. But he said, I got a different agenda. I got to figure out who is going to be a good partner to me when I'm elected. And if something were to happen to me, something terrible were to happen to me, who would the country have confidence in that they were up to the job? And I feel that's Cheney. So you go work on the politics of it. It was his first presidential decision, and he made it months before he got elected and months before he was sworn in. And uh, thanks for asking me. Hey, look. That, that office is powerful. There's something about the prestige of the Oval Office. I'd have members of Congress. Look, I office 15 steps away. 
I'd have members of Congress in my office, they'd say, by God, the president's screwing this thing up when I need, he needs to hear from me, and by God, we need those earmarks, and by God, he shouldn't be forcing us not to, my God, I'm going to go and tell him. Hey, let's go see him. We'd walk in, they'd say, God, Mr. President, you're looking really good today. <laughs> I'll tell you a true story. I'll tell you a true story. True story. Vladimir Putin, tough KGB guy. I mean, this guy is like a Russian Tony Soprano. You're around him, and he comes off as a tough, you know, you do me wrong, you're going to die. I mean, he is a really <laughs> KGB agent, you name it. He's making his first visit to the United States, first visit to the White House, standing in the Roosevelt Room, getting ready to walk into the, into the Oval Office, door opens in the hallway, walks in the hallway, door opens to the Oval Office, walks in the Oval Office, there it is, the HMS Resolute desk that every president, virtually every president since Rutherford B. Hayes has sat behind, wonderful windows looking out on the South Lawn, light streaming in, the Gilbert Stewart of, of, uh, of George Washington hanging over the fireplace, president's pictures of Texas there, walks in and looks at it, and you know what the first three words out of his mouth were? Oh, my God. <laughs> this guy was raised an atheist in the Soviet Union. <laughs> Seriously. And that's what, that is how powerful the office is. So, you know, but yet I saw there for seven years people, people walking in that Oval Office and you'd have the secretary of whatever here and the junior G person from level three of another cabinet department over here and they'd be sitting on those couches and President Bush would make certain that the junior G man or G woman, if they disagreed with the secretary of whatever, had their day. In fact, if they lost the argument, he'd be the first one to say you did a good job because he wanted people to come in there and say what they believed and back it up whether they, whether they end up winning the argument or not, he knew that was important. And it showed confidence as a leader. Of course, Cheney went on to shoot my lawyer, but that's another story. <laughs> Andrew, Andrew Malcolm. Andy, Andy Malcolm is originally from Montana, worked in the Bush campaign, and don't hold, him against, don't hold this against him, but he's a member of the editorial board of the LA Times. <laughs> No, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's a good guy. One of us. Shh, don't tell anybody. He's also got a fantastic blog. Andy, go ahead. What's the name of your blog? LATimes.com slash ticket. There we go. I'm not on the editorial board, and I'm writing exactly the opposite. There we go. Excellent. Thanks. Carl, I know from personal experience that writing a book is a long, arduous, and often difficult process. I know also how uh, private you've kept much of your life. What did you learn about yourself in the process of writing the book that, that you now know that you didn't before? It's really tough. Andy's written how many books? Ten, Ten books. And uh, I wish he'd warned me how difficult it was going to be. But I liked writing the book. I had a lot of fun doing it. It was hard, hard work. Uh, and I had great editors. I, really had, I was really helped by fantastic editors. Um, one of them uh, is Priscilla Payton, who is at Simon & Schuster, who was the managing editor of Time magazine for many, many years. And um, she was very tough. She would call me and say, I like what you've written, but here are four things you need to, you know, what, how did you feel? You know, what happened here? What happened there? The worst thing she did to me was I was really clacking along. I was going, I was blowing, I was going along. And last January, a year ago, she called me up and she said, God, I was turning in as I went along. And she said, I really like what I'm seeing, and you're really well along. But she said, um, you can't show up at the age of 42 in 1993 helping Bush run for governor. You know, you're kidding yourself if you don't think people want to know where you came from and how you became who you are. And she said, I've read the four biographies written about you. And I've made up a list of the ugly things that they say about you and your family in there. I just thought I wanted to be helpful. And I think you ought to, you know, here's your opportunity to set the record straight. Now, look, I'm not good, as Andy alluded to. Andy knows this. We're good friends. I don't like looking at my navel. <laughs> I just don't. And, you know, I am a relatively private person, despite the fact that I, you know, sort of, you know, I'm on television and in the Wall Street Journal and was sort of, you know, it was mentioned in the introduction, I, you know, I, I took a lot of arrows. Bush's his theory was, he said, better you than me. <laughs> but uh, I ended up writing in the book about, uh, about my family and about my early years, and particularly about my mom and dad, who were attacked after they died by journalists who wanted to say something ugly about me. 
And that's fine if they want to say something ugly about me. I, I got a thick skin. One journalist once said he doesn't have nerve endings. <laughs> but I got a thick skin. But, but I wanted to set the record straight about my mom, who led a very troubled life and committed suicide when I was 31, and my dad, who was a really sweet guy who lived here in California and passed in 2004. And so the first chapter of the book was the most difficult to write because it was about me and my family. But it was a chance for me to set the record straight, and I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, the time has come for us to uh, sign books. We're going to try and make this a little quick, a little bit easier than normal. I've signed book plates that they've placed in a lot of books if you want to just grab a book and go home. And I've signed some other books uh, if you want to buy a book that I've signed. And then I'll stick around and sign for those of you who want to actually watch me inscribe my name or have me inscribe it to you. But, but uh, I want to thank you again for having me here tonight, and thank you for all that you do to honor <laughs> our 40th president. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.